Test Geek Exam Prep LLC. Uh, I want to come to you today with a short explanation of some of the concepts that you are expected to find on the SIE exam, the Securities Industry Essentials exam, uh, which all new reps now must take. Uh, it's now been several months since the exam has been out, uh, and I just wanted to kind of pinpoint uh, some of the concepts that you need to know. Uh, when the exam first came out, FINRA produced a content outline. Now, they have a content outline for all of their exams. Always have. Now, if you've ever looked at one of these, and you can go online to FINRA's website uh, and find, download this, this content outline. But what you'll find is that it's extremely broad-based. I mean, it contains a lot of things. All of them. Series 7, Series 6, SIE, Series 24, they all do. Okay? Now, when the SIE first came out in October of 2018, right, all the publishers had to go by, including Test Geek Exam Prep, all we had to go by was this very broad content outline. So all the textbooks were written based upon this outline. So, you know, you get 200, 300, 400 page textbooks on this very broad based outline. But of course, the actual exams never cover that entire content. So you're reading a whole bunch of stuff in these textbooks that never show up on the test. So we want to try to focus and narrow our attention to what is more tested, uh, the concepts that you most likely will see on the test. I mean, that's what Test Geek Exam Prep is all about. What's on the test, how it most likely shows up on the test, and how you should answer it on the test. Okay? So, uh, a concept that there's, there's actually several uh, from the feedback that I've been getting that, that people kind of struggle with a little bit. Uh, on this video, of course, we're only going to tackle one of these potential con uh, content, and that would be new issues. Issuing new securities. In the content outline, they might actually refer to it as the primary market. Right? In, in all of my classes, I always mention that's the first market, the first source of the securities, right? So if, let's say, a corporation gets large enough, it is now expanded nationally, right? Um, you know, every company first starts locally, regionally, and then gets large enough, goes national or even international for that matter. And when a company grows that quickly, it needs a tremendous amount of capital money. Okay? And the best way to do that is to sell off a piece of the ownership of the company. In other words, issue stocks or bonds to the public. Okay? New issues, new securities. Now, uh, whatever company it is, it doesn't really matter which company it is or what type of company it is, you know, they're focused on their particular little niche in the world, right? And issuing securities uh, in the capital markets is really not their forte. So what they'll do is to hire uh, a large broker dealer like the Merrill Lynch's and the Morgan Stanley's in the world to help them issue these securities in the markets. Okay? Now, the broker dealer is going to serve really two roles in this capacity. One is to advise the issuer, that's the corporation who is issuing the securities. Okay? So they're going to advise them. What type of security should we issue? When should we do it? Uh, it will also help prepare all the uh, material information that needs to be sent to the SEC. Okay? We'll talk about that in a second. So that's one role that the broker-dealer uh, serves is in uh, advising the corporation. The other role, of course, is to then sell the securities, distribute the securities, to John and Jane Q Public, right? Now, in most of these, we refer to these as an IPO, an initial public offering. The first time the securities are ever issued to the public, okay? And it's kind of a big thing. I remember, uh, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, I remember Amazon, uh, I remember Starbucks. I was studying my Series 7 when uh, Starbucks went public. So, you know, it's a really big deal. And look at those companies today, right? So that's essentially the process. Now, in this capacity, 
Merrill is not simply known as a broker dealer. Oh, no, no, how pedestrian. Okay? In this capacity, you might hear them referred to as an underwriter or investment banker. Okay? These are just synonyms for broker dealer in the primary market. Okay? So anytime you see underwriter or investment banker, that really just means broker dealer in the primary market. Okay? Now, Merrill typically will not go this alone. They will invite some of their cronies along, some other large brokerage firms, to help handle this distribution. <laughs> you know, and de depending on the size of the distribution, how many shares are being sold, generally will determine how many other underwriters will join in. Okay? So now what we have is what's referred to as an underwriting syndicate. It's just a group of broker dealers acting as underwriters, helping to distribute a new issue. Okay? Now, that's all well and good. But prior to 1933, we were having these folks sell securities to the public without really disclosing much. So that's when, after the crash of 29, right, we came up with one of the main pillars of our industry, the Securities Act of 1933. Okay? Sometimes people simply refer to this as the Full and Fair Disclosure Act. Okay? Some people actually refer to it as the New Issues. There it is again, right? New Issues. The New Issues Act. Some people, now check this out, right? Some people simply refer to it as the Prospectus Act. Okay? Now, you know, these terms aren't really important, but I always describe them, these pseudonyms, these other names for the 30, uh, 33 Act, because it helps us to remember what it requires, right? I mean, it's quite simple. This might be like eight pages in your textbook, but now you know exactly what it is. It requires full and fair disclosure of all new securities, new issues, via the use of a prospectus. Okay? It requires full and fair disclosure of all new issues through the use of a prospectus. In a nutshell, that's what the 33 Act is all about. Okay? Now, just to give you a little bit more context right, around this, what this basically means is that we must register the securities with the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission. Right? So that's what I was talking about, about the uh, material information. Uh, Merrill, the underwriter, the lead underwriter, is going to help prepare all of that and send it into the SEC. Okay? So we send in the information, thus we then register the securities with the SEC. That, in essence, is full and fair disclosure of these new issues. So every time a corporation issues new shares to the public, they would have to register those securities with the SEC. That is, in essence, what the 33 Act requires. Okay? Now, your textbooks may go into uh, a much more elaborate detail of what the 33 Act requires, which you generally won't see until you get to the Series 6 and actually more to the Series 7. Okay? Now, what the SIE oftentimes tests us on, and why they do this, I don't know. I mean, that's the crux of the law. Okay? But what they test us on oftentimes are the exceptions to this rule, or what we call exemptions. They're exempt from the law. Now, there are certain entities based solely upon who they are are exempt from all federal securities acts. Okay? Guess who that might be, right? And the US government, uh, state governments, that's municipalities, banks and insurance companies, because they have their own regulators. Okay? Again, for the test, not really all that testable. Okay? However, also there are exceptions based on the type of distribution this is, a type of issuing. 
right? These are initial public offerings, but there are many that are far, far more limiting. Some are known as private offerings, okay? This really only applies to public offerings, not private ones, okay? So we have some private, what we call private placements, okay? And generally that's only to uh, accredited investors, right? Those are high net worth individuals, okay? And then we have some other exceptions, uh, what we call intrastate offerings. Notice, these are when the securities are only issued in one state. And as far as the federal government is concerned, right, as long as it doesn't cross state boundaries, the feds really don't deal with it, only the state does. So this also is exempted from the 33 Act. Now, what does that truly mean? Okay. Whether the security and the issuer is exempt, or the type of offering, what we call an exempt transaction. But does it matter? What these exemptions mean is it's exempt from the registration requirement and the prospectus requirement. Generally, these type of offerings do not require prospectuses. It doesn't, however, and this is kind of contradictory, it doesn't, however, exempt them from disclosure. They still have to let investors know what these offerings are about and what the issuer is about, but just not as much as a public offering through a prospectus, okay? So what they typically will offer rather than a prospectus, is something called an offering circular. And if I'm not mistaken, you generally don't see these in the textbooks. They might go into some of these exemptions. Boy, they sure do go into this process quite a bit, okay? But you generally don't see this, except <laughs> on the test, okay? So that's why I come to you today, because I want you to understand that this is for the normal garden variety public offerings. But there are some exceptions, some, some kind of limited offerings, private or in one state. Now, oftentimes in a test question, you see, and if you're new to the tests or test world, of course, if you're taking the SIE, that means you're new to the test world. Uh, they like to throw a lot of superfluous stuff around that. It might be uh, some sort of elaborate type of offering, like, uh, like a limited partnership or uh, some sort of other exotic kind of offering, right? And they'll throw a whole bunch of that stuff in the question. But really, the only key term to the test question is what? That it's offered only in one state, Therefore, it's an offering circular that's required to be disclosed, okay? So be careful of that. That's what we say, right? What shows up on the test, how it shows up on the test, and how you should answer it on the test. That's what this is about, okay? It's really not about uh, education. It's about knowing how to pass these multiple choice standardized exams, right? That's what it's all about. Okay, so be careful of that. Uh, there's some also some other questions relating to private placements. Uh, because it's private, because it's exempt from the registration, the stock is often restricted. That means you can't sell it in the open market. That restriction generally is for six months. Now, this stuff has been on a lot of FINRA exams for a long time, especially the Series 7, okay? So you, you most often will see it a couple of times on the SIE, and if you are then going to do the Series 7 top-off, you might see it again, and it can get a little bit deeper on the Series 7, okay? And as I also mentioned, uh, it is sold only to accredited investors, it's a good idea to know the definition for an accredited investor, right? That is one who has a million dollars in net worth, okay? 
uh, they and their spouse combined a million dollars, that's fine, or 200,000 in annual income. Or if it's the uh, spouses investing jointly, then their income has to be a combined 300,000. Uh, generally, they don't get too deep with that. You know, it's also like 200,000 for the past two years and reasonably expected to make it a third year. You know, you see all that stuff in the textbook, but they don't generally go that deeply into the test. Essentially, a million dollars net worth, alone or combined with a spouse, and or 200,000 in annual income, okay? It's about as far as they go. They don't really go too much deeper than that. The wording can get a little kind of tricky. They'll start throwing some other stuff at you. But essentially, million net worth, 200,000 in income, okay? So you'll see that too. So guess what? Uh, you can potentially see the intrastate offering and the offering circular. So again, the question might say, you know, it's an intrastate along with all this other stuff. It might be some exotic type of offering like limited partnerships or some god awful thing, right? But of course, the only key term is the intrastate. And they'll say what type of disclosure is required and the answer is an offering circular. But guess what? One of the wrong answer choices is going to say, the prospectus. Now you see, and this is where some of the disconnect may occur between the textbooks and the real exam. Okay? Because again, I don't see this term showing up very often in a textbook. Okay? So all that you might be aware of for a new offering would be a prospectus, you'd be tempted to pick that. Okay? You might also see something in a, an answer choice called a red herring, which is actually a preliminary prospectus that's offered prior to the, uh, it actually being sold to the public. There's a little cooling off period that goes on here where we can give a preliminary prospectus. Okay, so that might be an answer choice, the red herring, a prospectus, uh, something that might deal with the exotic uh, offering like a partnership agreements or some other sort of document that may sound good, that kind of matches with some of the superfluous material. But again, what we're looking for is the offering circular. That's generally the disclosure requirement for some of these exempted transactions. Okay? Those that don't have to go through this normal process and requires a prospectus. It requires instead an offering circular. Okay? So it's kind of complicated, I know. Uh, you know, for a basic entry exam, I would rather them concentrate on the basic rules and laws that govern 90% of the offerings rather than you know, these exotics. But the tests have always done this. The tests have always been asking this stuff for a long, long time. Okay? So a couple of concepts that you can probably see on the SIE. Uh, don't forget, if you go onto our website, testgeekexamprep.com, right, uh, scroll down, you'll see a little black box that says view videos. Uh, click onto that, that'll take you to the video course platform where you can then find uh, the entire video course for the SIE exam, as well as all the top offs, the Series 6 and Series 7. Uh, and the NASA exam 6566. Okay? Uh, if you have any questions, comments, opinions, editorials, whatever, please don't hesitate. Right? I like to tell people I live but in the test world. I have no real life. So if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me an email, brian at testgeekexamprep.com. We're all after the same thing, right? We want to get a P, pass this exam. That way, you can then start on your top-off exam and then some of the other exams. Generally, you have, when you're brand new in the industry, generally three tests to do, right? The SIE, one of the top-offs, and then the 63 agents exam, okay? Or you may actually go into the Series 66, where that is the advisor rep. So there's all kinds of licensing when first getting started, but this, of course, is the first one, okay? So if I can help you in any way, please feel free, shoot me an email. Thanks for joining. Hope to see you around down the road. Take care. Bye-bye.